Stop. When I say treaty, you say rights. Treaty. Rights. Treaty. Rights. Treaty. Rights. Treaty. Rights. When I say no more, you say pipelines. No more. Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. Repeat after me. Line three is violence. We won't be silent. 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 We have uh, some more chants here. Repeat after me. We can't drink oil. Keep it in the soil. We can't drink oil. Keep it in the soil. We can't drink oil. Keep it in the soil. We can't drink oil. Keep it in the soil. All right. So I want you to show me what solidarity looks like. And you're going to say, this is what solidarity looks like. What does solidarity look like? What does solidarity look like? Show me what solidarity looks like. All right. So there's this little song that I uh, heard at a Pipeline 3 event not so long ago, and I really enjoy it, so I want to share it with you all today. And it goes like this. I'm going to repeat it once, and then you can hopefully join along afterwards. If you love the water, Mississippi, then have the courage to stop line three. Here we go. If you love the water, Mississippi, then have the courage to stop line three. If you love the water, Mississippi, then have the courage to stop line three. Alrighty, so um, thank you all for being here. Uh, just wanted to say that we're here to tell President Biden to stop line three. And we're also here, I know many of us, in a lot of grief, whether it be with uh, the decrease in our air quality through the wildfires in Canada, or just recently, recently the Green Word fire, um, with the drought that's going on, uh, the, and the pollution of our water, and how we're seeing this in our patient population. And this is not just for uh, our children or grandchildren, but for us right now, and our patients right now at the bedside. And so, I would like to welcome uh, one of the doctors that is working on the front lines, Dr. Lalitha Shirapaneni, um, MD, MPH. Thank you so much, Toya, for getting us started. Uh, we are today joined by our indigenous leaders, Keisha Martinu, and her, uh, their family are just walking over here, so I want to wait until they can join us. Treaty. Rights. 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 Treaty. Rights.
you say? Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. No more. Pipelines. All righty, all righty. I think you all know this one, so we're just going to go for it. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Line three has got to go. All righty. So, um, I would like to welcome uh, Tasha Mar Oh, sorry, Tasha Martineau of uh, the Fond du Lac Tribe, Indigenous Water Protector, and founder of Camp Magisi and the Gichigumi Scouts. Hello, um, <clears throat> I'm Alex Goldenwolf from Camp Mugizi. Um I've been living there for like, since the beginning of the year actually. And it's actually like um, changed my life for the better. Like I've never been happier living on the front lines at Camp Mugizi. I've done a ton of healing, a lot of like trauma work, and it's very beautiful, the camp that like Tasia has going right now. And it's in a very, really good state. And there's many beautiful people that are coming to the front line and staying there and living there, whether it's just like a couple days or like a couple months. Like we all came together because of one reason, and that is um, for the water and for the monoman and to protect the sacred. And so, yeah, I think that's very beautiful because we need to live in a community together where we can thrive and grow and this is like a great opportunity for people to come to the front lines and really like um, pursue their passion like one of my passions is um, making art and I haven't like been able to make art like making, like day to day like working a job but here I'm able to like draw paint you know just pursue passions do what I love and protect the water because water is life and it is beautiful thank you I'm just Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are all treaty people. Thank you so much. So thank you to everyone for being here in solidarity with Anishinaabe water protectors who are defending their sacred water, land, and treaty rights. My name is Lalita Serpanini. I'm an internal medicine uh, today, we're here to call on President Biden and the Army Corps to revoke the clean water permits and immediately put an end, up, end to construction of Line 3. We are joined by health professionals from across the country today. Health professionals in Oregon, Washington, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Michigan, Wisconsin, Maine, Vermont, Philadelphia, DC, Maryland, and Virginia are delivering letters to their local Army Corps offices. We're also joined by some health professionals on social media from uh, Canada who are working upstream to stop the flow of tar sands oil um, and working to oppose the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. They stand in solidarity with us because as health professionals, we know that climate change is a health crisis. And climate change knows no borders. And the line three uh, will have an impact on patients and communities all over the country. This is why health professionals across the country um, are also involved in climate justice fights. And I wanted to mention uh, some of those um, movements that they're involved in because we stand in solidarity with them too. 
in Washington. Health professionals, um, just like in Minnesota, the Washington state has allowed fossil fuel projects to continue even as their state burns. In Tacoma, the Puget Sound Energy is violating Medicine Creek Treaty by building an enormous fracked gas facility um, on ancestral Puyallup tribe lands. Um, boo indeed. In um, Oregon, health professionals are um, working to stop Zenith oil. In Wisconsin, clinicians for climate action are also caring for communities that are suffering the harms of Enbridge pipelines. In addition, um, they are also working with, uh, the, uh, they also stand in solidarity with the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians who are opposing the Namaji Trail Energy Center. In Michigan, um, I think Michigan health professionals probably know best about the dangers of oil spills from Enbridge pipelines. In 2010, uh, the Kalamazoo River spilled, um, uh, this is the costliest inland oil spill. Um, oil spilled into the Kalamazoo River, and it's the same tar sands oil that will go through line three. In Massachusetts, they're fighting Enbridge compressor station in Weymouth and Virginia clinicians are fighting the Lambert uh, compressor station um, as the Mountain Valley pipeline goes through indigenous lands. There is a common thread here. You know, yes, all of these projects worsen the climate crisis, but we see that indigenous communities who hold centuries of wisdom of what we now call in the sciences as planetary health, they are suffering the worst impacts, uh, not just to their bodies, not just to their land, but to their bodies as they defend sacred land and water against fossil fuel infrastructure. So as health professionals, uh, we will work towards a fossil free future uh, for the health of our communities, our indigenous communities, and our future generations. The science is clear. The time is now. President Biden, stop line three. Hello everyone, my name is Tasha Marno. I'm a two-spirit indigenous warrior from the front lines of the Line 3 fight. I want to say thank you to each and, one of, each and every one of you for being out here today, joining us here in northern Minnesota, which is the treaty territories of the Anishinaabe people and the ancestral homelands of the Ocheti Seko and Oyate. Um, oftentimes, you know, you join a fight and you kind of bury yourself there, and something that happens you know, more often than not, is something called idol culture. You know, you get these leaders who believe that their story is the most important thing to be told, and they center themselves. I don't want to be one of those people, so I want to take a moment to introduce you to my sister, Jake Spotted Wolf, who can come up here and, you know, speak about the fight moving forward, and, you know, she's an amazing speaker, she brings a lot to the fight, and she's the other matriarch of Camp Megazy, so give it up for Jake. <laughs> Um, I've been at Camp McGeezy since May 19th. Let's see here, I am uh, Jake Spotted Wolf. I'm from three affiliated tribes. That's Mandan, Hidatsu, and Sanish out of North Dakota. Um, I'm an activist out of Seattle, Washington. And like I said, I've been uh, with Camp McGeezy since the end of May. I came out for five days and I accidentally stayed for the rest of the summer <laughs> fighting this fight, um, both for climate and for indigenous rights. Uh, resource extraction is the new cultural genocide, and genocide never stopped for indigenous peoples in this country. So to look at it from that lens, in terms of what is it costing indigenous communities for these projects to continue to go through our states, through our reservations. 
Uh, we've got the DNA Nation, who most people would know as Navajo, uh, that can't drink their water because it's been contaminated by the uranium mines that came in and spoiled the water table completely. So they've had to travel an hour each way to go get water and bring it back to their homes. Hence the reason they had some of the highest COVID rates and deaths throughout the entirety of America last year. They couldn't sanitize their own homes. Then there are things like the sex trafficking that happens up and down the pipeline. That might not sound like it has anything to do with climate, but when you're destroying communities and culture and taking our women and our children for the purpose of exploiting them and trafficking them as pipeline workers, that destroys the root of a nation, of people that were here before and that have not been treated well or with kindness or with health in mind or with community in mind. So we've got that epidemic along with the fact that the frack outs that have happened all summer with Enbridge and all the drilling that they did up on the Mississippi, the Willow, Shell, the water went from being pristine and clear and now you see the images of the oil just sitting on top. What's that gonna do to the wetlands? What's that gonna do to all the animals that lived around that, the marsh, the rice that people eat, that people from Anishinaabe and Ojibwe territories have been subsisting on for millions, well, not millennia. Um, what is that gonna do to that rice, right? It's gonna uh, destroy it. It's just another form of how indigenous have been killed culturally, spiritually, and physically since this nation has been colonized. So I point these things out to say, we don't have a big enough voice. We're 1% of the population. And the American government has tried every way possible to make sure that we don't succeed as a race. So we need bigger voices, we need more activism, we need people that are gonna stand up and say, we refuse to allow the indigenous to be killed any further. We refuse to take any more of their resources. We refuse to break any more treaties because the government has broken every treaty that it made with the Native American nation on this soil for the purpose of resource extraction. So when will it stop? When will we matter enough? When will climate matter enough, which is rooted in indigeneity, that America is gonna stand up and say, we're done. We're not gonna let these people die anymore. We're not gonna kill their land anymore. And we're gonna make sure that they're safe and well taken care of so that not only the indigenous can have a future, but every other American can have a future because everybody's future is at risk. It's not just indigenous here. So keep that in mind when you take these stories back that these pipes will burst and when they do, they're gonna leak oil everywhere. That water will become contaminated. That marsh will become contaminated. And it will have been too late at that point. For jobs that did not stay in Minnesota, because that was the selling point for Enbridge, we're bringing in commerce and economy. The pipeline workers come from other states quite often. They spend their money back home to the people, the families that they're, they're sending it back home to. So they might stay and like spend money on a hotel, maybe at a restaurant, but that, Oil is coming from tar sands in Alberta, through the state of Minnesota, going to a port and then being shipped to a foreign entity. So if economy and commerce is the root of why they talked us into this whole thing, and it will not be helping the economy, use that. Use that as your talking point when you go to try to fight other people that say that Enbridge is good for Minnesotans. It's not good for Minnesotans. It's not good for the Anishinaabe. It's not good for anybody who is trying to live a green, clean future. And the fact that we are so capable and so highly evolved as human beings, yet so unimaginative to continue to use fossil fuel when there are so many other ways that we can leave a clean, sustainable future baffles my mind. That we're not investing in solar, we're not investing in hemp, we're not investing, what is it, Amsterdam has those roads? that are solar <laughs> that you can drive on. I'm like, that's fucking genius. Keep it up, right? Why are we not doing that? I hope we can cuss here, Tasha. Well. <laughs> I get a little heated about it because I feel like we're, wasted, we're wasting effort and energy by trying to uh, continue to please corporations that just need to make their billions while people die because of resource extraction. 
So thank you for your time. Thanks for the mic. Um, and I hope that you all uh, stay strong in this fight. Um, we didn't get as much. We, we fought pretty hard this summer on the front lines. It was a long, hard fight. Um, I am proud that I was able to serve with my sisters and brothers and um, non-binary friends up on the front lines. Um, we didn't take and bridge down as much as we wanted to or what the picture looked like, but that does not mean that we did not win the fight because you're all still standing here. You're all still willing to take these messages home to your communities. And that means that one day we can see a clean and sustainable future. So thank you. Um, hello again. Uh, I just want to, you know, kind of introduce myself more so, so that you know who it is I am. You know, when I speak about where I'm from, that's Nagachi Wenang. I come from the Fond du Lac Reservation. I come from 1854 Treaty Territory, and I also come from the reservation that approved the Line 3 project. I came from the community that took away the voice of the other Anishinaabe nations. I come from the same tribe that silenced Red Lake, shut down White Earth, and gave no choice to Leech Lake and all the other tribes. And it's because of that I see it as my responsibility to ensure that the children of my tribe in a hundred years from now when they speak about how we stopped Line 3, there'll be a young Two-Spirit who will braid their hair proudly because those of us from Fond du Lac did care. Our governing body does not speak for us. We will stand with Red Lake. We will stand with White Earth. We will fight for Leech Lake. And we will continue fighting because the fight is not over yet. You know, many of us, when we went out to Standing Rock, they told us that the project was 85% complete. I brought my daughter there, my oldest daughter, and when I came home, I made her a promise that I would stop Line 3. Many of us at Stranding Rock were willing to die. This is my home. There's nothing I'm not willing to give at this point. And that's why it's so important that we reach out to those who do have the executive power to stop this. Because if they build Line 3, they might as well bury me beneath it. Because I cannot allow them to complete this project. They can build it, but I will do everything in my power to make sure that no oil flows through that pipe. And I'm not here to try and appease to the white gaze. I'm not here to simp for Biden. I'm not here to beg the Army Corps of Engineers to see me as a human being worth protecting. I'm here for all of you. I'm here to ask you to join me in northern Minnesota because I need more bodies on the front line and I'd never ask anyone to do something that I'm not willing to do for as bleh, I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. So I want to tell you about my experience in Red Lake. When I stood tied to a tree learning how to breathe so that I could awaken the spirit of Crazy Horse and call out to the Lakota to come home. <gasps> And that call was answered, but we still need more people because we can't do this without you. Those treaties are a two-way deal. You're treaty people too. My connection to this land goes so deep that there's not a pipeline on earth that can reach that. And I need you to reconnect because I have four children at home, three of whom are indigenous women and I have to dress them every single day because of the, statistic, the statistics of MMIW. I need to know exactly what they're wearing in case one of them don't come home. So every time you see these white trucks of Enbridge, you know, trespassing on lands that are sacred, I have to remain vigilant and I have to watch these workers because oftentimes their eyes are trespassing the children of my tribe. When projects like this are built, such as Dakota Access Pipeline, KXL, Line 3, Line 5, the statistics that we face as Indigenous women go up by 22%. These projects are exasperating both the drug and sex trafficking issues that have already devastated Indian country. And I need you to know that. 
I need you to recognize that MMIW is not just a hashtag. It is an everyday nightmare for Indigenous mothers all across Turtle Island. Because we don't know. We don't know which one of us is next. And that's a fear we ask ourselves every day when we wake up. Every day when I have to dress my young daughters. I have to ask myself which one. Which one before the age of 15 is going to be sexually assaulted? Which one may end up murdered? And that's a question that I want answered by the Biden administration and the Army Corps of Engineers. Because when they allowed Line 3, they declared war on the Anishinaabe. And they are in for the fight of their life because I'm not leaving the front line. If they want their blood, that blood on their hands, I invite them to come and take it. Because I'm not going anywhere. We glitch for your time. What do I get this to? Moving and upsetting speech. Um, I would like to repeat a statement uh, that we have uh, health professionals for healthy climate put out condemning the use of chemical weapons, rubber bullets, and other violence against indigenous water protectors and allies peacefully demonstrating uh, against line three. We stand in solidarity and condemn the violence against indigenous water protectors. And um, our statement can be read on our website. And uh, we welcome other health organizations to join us. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Jonathan Patz, MD, MPH, Director of uh, Global Health Institute, University of Wisconsin-Madison. <laughs> Thank you. Three converging realities make it impossible in good conscience to expand the delivery of harmful tar sands oil into our country. First is the release of the new report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that has been interpreted as code red for humanity. Second are the priorities of the Biden administration to build back better with the American Jobs Plan to build an energy infrastructure for today and the future, not relying on yesterday's technologies? And third, who can ignore this summer's weather disasters? Heat records were broken across the West, including locations like Portland, Oregon, that saw temperatures of 116 degrees for a week and hundreds dead in Oregon, Washington, and in British Columbia. Emergency rooms saw 70 times more patients compared to the same time last year. Wildfires erupted and the smoke spread across the country, even affecting us here in the Midwest, causing risk to children with asthma. And according to the Weather Attribution Initiative, that extreme heat dome and disastrous climate was virtually impossible to have occurred without human-caused climate change. Relevant to the Enbridge Line 3, let me highlight conclusions from this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report released two weeks ago. First, the science is unequivocal. That's quoted from the report. The science is unequivocal that the heating of the planet is caused by human activities, especially burning oil, coal, and gas. Second, climate impacts are already happening now. The rise in frequency and intensity of unprecedented extreme weather events is caused by climate change. And third, strongly reducing emissions now can avoid the worst climate disasters, including heat waves and floods. And every intervention 
to lower emissions matters. Finally, another last conclusion I want to cite, it's very likely that we will cross the threshold of two degrees centigrade warming, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warming by mid-century under current business as usual, high fossil fuel emission scenarios. So does expanding line three make sense at this point in time? The carbon intensity of extracting oil, the open pit mining that, it, that makes the oil from tar sands, makes this the world's most destructive oil operation, threatening our, our lives and the environment. Expanding Line 3 would have the equivalent impact of adding 50 new coal-fired power plants. Expanding Line 3 would have the equivalent impact of adding 38 million vehicles on our roads. Expanding Line 3 would add five times as much greenhouse gases compared to what Minnesota expects to be emitting in the year 2050. We are not waiting for new technology to pivot away from oil. On the contrary, according to an international energy assessment from 2019, if all subsidies were removed, renewables plus batteries have become the cheapest way to generate electricity. And we are phasing out oil from the transportation sector. The Biden administration plans to invest $174 billion to win the electric vehicle market. One goal is to install a half a million charging stations in nine years. Another goal is to re replace and electrify 50,000 diesel transit vehicles and 20% of school buses. The demand for oil is shrinking fast. But what about jobs in the Midwest? A study from my state of Wisconsin, uh, a study of the Wisconsin energy market found that if 100% of Wisconsin energy was met with clean energy, mostly wind and solar, that would produce 160,000 new jobs. And our health would, would immediately benefit. 1,900 lives would be saved each year, and the financial gains from those avoided deaths, along with hospitalizations and lost work days from air pollution, would save the state of Wisconsin $21 billion every year. One feature of tar sands oil brings this full circle to the field of public health.